Well, hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP, and you're watching NP Practice Made Simple, the weekly videos to help save you time, frustration, and help you learn faster so you can take the best care of your patients. So in this video, I'm gonna be doing an update about coronavirus. I made a video back in March, in March of 2020, but it quickly became outdated because of all the information that we've gained so far. So I wanted to uh, give an update of an overview of coronavirus and the approach and things to think about in the outpatient setting as it relates to diagnosis, testing, and management. So yeah, with that, I'll, I will just jump in. So just to step back for a second, the virus itself is SARS-CoV-2, which causes the disease of COVID-19. And actually SARS-CoV-2 is in the family of coronaviruses that includes MERS and SARS. And so I remember at the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, that um, people were asking about testing and there was a coronavirus panel that they had for some respiratory swabs, which at the time included MERS and SARS, et cetera, et cetera, but wasn't specific to coronavirus uh, COVID-19. But anyway, um, and also one note I want to make before I jump in any further is that this is the information that we have as up to date as it is from a primary care perspective. So um, it is very high level and it is also um, potentially going to become outdated as well. So keeping yourself um, refreshed depending on the time that you're watching this with the CDC, CDC website, World Health Organization website, um, the IDSA, uh, Infectious Disease Society of America website. Um, utilizing those resources as they will continue to be updated. So as it relates to coronavirus, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, the incubation period, I want to start by talking about that because that's actually really important to understand. So the incubation period is actually up to 14 days. Most people, when they're exposed to the virus and then they become symptomatic, is usually about day four to five. And the period of infectiousness for patients with normally functioning immune systems is actually seven to 10 days approximately. So, and for patients who have compromised immune systems, it's thought to be a little bit longer, more on the 20 day side. So I say that because of a number of reasons, it'll tie in in a, in a second as I talk about testing and, and management of coronavirus, but just know that patients are, are actually infectious before they become symptomatic around day four or five. So how is it spread? So um, droplet spread is the primary route that uh, coronavirus COVID-19 is spread from person to person through respiratory droplets in a period of within six feet distance of another person. Studies what we have so far is found to be on surfaces as well. So theoretically patients can touch a surface and touch their mucous membranes and then become infected that way, but it is a much less likely route than the droplet um, spread from person to person within six feet. There's also some contention about airborne spread. And so there's been evidence so far, especially with aerosolizing procedures, things like nebulization, CPR, intubation, that actually it can become aerosolized and spread a lot more easily than the droplet route. Um, but just the, the end word on that in terms of the medical literature is that it is controversial. <laughs> So I'll leave it at that. So what are the symptoms? So I think by this time you are probably aware of all of the symptoms, but I just want to recap them from most common to least common and a couple of sneaky things that you want to think about. So cough, about 50% of patients, fever, body aches, headache, dyspnea, sore throat, and I'm looking down at my notes so I don't miss any, um, diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, and actually loss of smell and taste has gotten a lot of popularity in, in the news and media, but it's actually a lot farther down on the list than all of these other symptoms. So um, abdominal pain, rhinorrhea, um, runny nose, those can also be around that same commonality. Um, you can also have some dermatologic manifestations. So you can have things like reddish purple nodules on the distal digits of the toes, especially in kids and young adults. Again, I'm talking about adults in this video, but it can happen with young adults too. Those are called quote unquote COVID toes. Um, you can also get maculopapular rashes, urticarial rashes, vesicular eruptions, and the transient levato reticularis. Um, um, that's a nice one to Google if you want to take a look at that, um, that particular dermatologic manifestation. But um, there's a lot of things that it can present, present as. And so I think it's just important to be mindful of what are, what are all of the potential things. Some people are presenting with nausea and vomiting and diarrhea as their primary, um, as their primary presentation. So keeping that all in mind. One thing to note about symptoms, and you probably know this at this point, but about 80% of cases are mild, luckily, and patients will get a mild case and they'll get better on their own. Uh, the next percentage of people is actually severe, about 14-ish percent of patients will have severe illness, and about 5% of patients will have critical illness. The mortality rate is around 2 to 3%, depending on the resources that you're looking at, and um, the risk of severe infection tends to increase with 
risk factors, right? So increasing age, diabetes, immunocompromised status, cancer, um, chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, those are like the major ones to think about um, in terms of those patients are at higher risk for decompensation and severe illness. Um, another important note about symptoms is that um, patients will, uh, what we've seen so far is that uh, there are several complications, right? So if they're getting into critical and severe illness or severe cases that don't need hospitalization, we just have to be really careful that those patients can actually be, go into respiratory you know, decline, compromise towards failure, and that typically happens either early on in illness or actually closer to the eight day mark, seven to nine days. So that's really important to keep in mind, especially with patients who have higher risk factors. Um, so there's something for them to watch out for, right? And so if you're seeing them at day one of symptoms, keeping in mind that they might have a compromise or decline around that time. So there's a couple complications of COVID-19, especially patients who are hospitalized, but it's also important to keep in mind in the primary care setting. So one is it causes a hypercoagulable state, and we don't fully understand why. The vast majority of patients in the outpatient setting will not need any sort of treatment for that anticoagulation of any kind. The caveat there being if they have underlying risk factors needing anticoagulation aside from COVID-19, that is something that is a clinical decision, clinical judgment decision that you, I recommend you would make with your supervisor um, collaborating um, colleagues that I would make a decision with them as well. So for example, patients who have had a prior DVT, a prior pulmonary embolism, recent surgery, recent trauma, things like that, I will definitely collaborate and think about anticoagulating those patients, but for the vast majority of patients, that is not recommended. One other thing to think about as it relates to the symptom presentation, it's important to be mindful of patients who are presenting for the first time with um, suspected pulmonary embolism or they have pulmonary embolism or DVT. You wanna keep COVID-19 in the back of your mind. Again, assessing why they might have an, a blood clot in the first place, but keeping that in your mind of the potential risk factor. The other thing that tends to happen in the, in the hospital setting is it can cause encephalopathy and some other neurologic complications. So for example, if you have somebody who's coming in primarily with their altered mental status, especially those with risk factors, older adults, things like that, you want to keep in mind that is potentially in your differential diagnosis now. And also notably, uh, as it relates to cardiac, um, on the hypercoagulable state as well, can lead to some cardiac injury. So again, if you have patients with cardiovascular issues coming into your clinic, keeping COVID-19 in the back of your mind as well. Um, so testing, there's kind of three different options. So one is NAT, uh, N-A-A-T, nucleic acid amplification test, usually with a PCR or reverse transcriptase PCR added on as well. I'm not super savvy with all the different types of testing to be really honest, but um, this is typically what you've seen so far probably, which is a nasal swab, a nasopharyngeal swab done by a provider, anterior nares, uh, bilateral anterior nares obtained by the provider. There's some self-testing for patients in the clinic setting, in the home setting, um, and they have not been studied enough. They are all under emergency use authorization and to obtain that they need certain level of sensitivity and specificity to be approved but in terms of the overall study of all of the different options there isn't one that's like a gold standard in my current clinic we're just still doing nasopharyngeal swabs because that's what we've been doing the whole time as obtained by the provider but there are other options as well nucleic acid amplification tests are the, the main kind of gold standard if there is one two other options are antigen testing and serology testing so antigen testing is less sensitive and specific than doing the NAT testing I don't have great data numbers about it but um, you can can, you can do that one and uh, potentially is also helpful. I'll talk about false positives and negatives in a second. I just want to touch on serology. So serology is looking for antibodies. And the reasons we do that is typically so far, as I understand it, if we're looking for somebody who's had symptoms for about three to four weeks, they have a negative nucleic acid amplification test, you can add on a serology test for antibodies, IgG specifically, to see if it becomes up um, as a positive test. I'm not a virologist and I'm not an infectious disease specialist, and so and I'm not super savvy with all the different tests, but it sounds like it's less sensitive and specific and accurate after that five week mark. So it sounds like there's kind of a golden time period to do that test and it becomes less accurate after that time. So something to keep in mind if patients are coming in saying, oh, I just want the serology test, I just wanna know. 
that's as far as I understand, and, I, and if I get more information, I will share it with you, but as far as I understand, it's really just to identify patients who are persistently symptomatic, who have a negative NAT test, and are in that three to four weeks after the onset of symptoms um, as the ideal time. You can start to have antibodies around 14 days. If you try to test any sooner than that, they're probably not gonna be there. And the reason for IgG instead of IgM versus total, it is just found to be the most accurate so far. So going back to false positives and negatives though, false positives are a lot less common. They're quite rare. And again, I don't really have numbers and I apologize. That's all that I have, um, that those are very rare. False negatives are anywhere from five to 40%, depending on the studies that have been done so far. So that's just something to keep in mind. Two really pearls of practice I want you to keep in mind about that. One is if you have patients who are convincingly looking like COVID, like they have COVID-19 and they have a negative NAT test, the recommendation is to continue to quarantine and assume that they have that and then recheck in about 24 to 48 hours. There's no standardized time. That's just the general consensus to recheck. The other thing to think about is that patients are coming in with a potential exposure. Again, going back to incubation period, they are exposed to somebody who has COVID-19. They come in the next day and they want to test. Right? And based on the incubation period, it may or may not be positive yet. Right, So it can take about four to five plus days, up to 14 days for them to have symptoms. So the recommendation typically is to wait five days, assume that they have COVID, quarantine appropriately, test them about five to seven days, and if they have a negative test, if they have no symptoms, potentially being able to take them off of the quarantining measures. Um, however, testing the next day is not appropriate and is not helpful and is not safe. So that is the recommendation. And then another note about testing, at this time, as far as I have consulted with the resources that I found, it is actually not recommended to do testing for people to return to work, to return to a living setting. It is just not, like we don't have a handle on it enough to use that as a tool. Um, I, I know a lot of people are coming in and looking for that. You can persistently have a positive test for weeks and weeks and weeks. Again, it doesn't necessarily correlate with their period of infectiousness. So it's thought to be, again, infectiousness lasts for about seven to 10 days, up to 20 days if they have an immunocompromised status. But the isolation precautions of patients staying at home, wearing masks, avoiding work, avoiding other people, is about at least 10 days have passed. I'm looking down so I don't misspeak. There's three criteria. At least 10 days have passed since the symptoms first appeared. At least one day, 24 hours of no fever without any antipyretics. Um, and there is improvement in their symptoms, right? And so that is the criteria. Again, keeping in mind patients with immunocompromised statuses, statuses, status I, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's right, statuses. Um, but uh, keeping that in mind um, when you're taking patients off of precaution. So the last thing I wanna to touch on is treatment, and these are all preliminary things. Like spoiler alert, there's not a whole lot here. So the, these are all investigational treatments. Two main ones um, that have been uh, administered outside of the setting of a clinical trial are both single dose IV infusions three days after symptom onset in patients with mild COVID-19 with those additional risk factors. So again, the patients who have risk factors for getting a lot worse, advancing age, diabetes, immunocompromised status, cancer, CKD, um, cardiovascular disease, that's the general catch-all kind of category. Um, higher BMI, I believe, is also a risk factor. So. Uh, for those patients, there have been some larger medical centers who have been able to do a single dose outpatient of IV infusion of either monoclonal antibodies or high titer convalescent plasma. These are investigational treatments. I am not currently seeing that in my clinic. Um, I think the, the, the general advice is that if you have access to that, awesome. And if not, the other patients are, it's, it's important to consider clinical trials. So what clinical trials do you have access to? So like, is there a way that you and your clinic investigate the larger medical centers if you have access to them or, or other resources in your area that are doing clinical trials with investigational treatments and preparing that ahead of time so that when patients come in, you wanna think about those patients potentially referring them there. There's a whole litany of other investigational treatments that I don't really wanna get into in this video because again, they're investigational and it's really actually only recommended to do those inside of a clinical trial setting. And I wanna know what I wanna make about that. Um, and kind of a line in the sand that I wanna draw is that this is really important to me that like so many patients and then sometimes providers too will say things like, what's the harm? right? What's the harm in trying hydroxychloroquine? What's the harm in trying X, Y, and Z? And it's really important for us to recognize that there is always risk of harm. There is always a risk. Anything we do in medicine, 
maybe aside from like talking to people or maybe diaphragmatic breathing or something like I don't know maybe you have an example of an intervention that doesn't have any risk associated but basically every everything has a risk so um, be really cautious about that what's the harm conversation that a lot of patients will come in with asking about a treatment potential investigational treatment and my my mo go to is that i'm going to investigate the clinical trial options that there are and then advise them further so hopefully this video is helpful please let me know what questions you have in next week's video i'm going to be talking about post covid symptoms which is we're seeing a lot of right now in primary care um, so stay tuned for that if you haven't grabbed the ultimate resource guide for the new np head over to realworldnp.com guide you get these videos sent straight to your inbox every week with notes from me patient stories and bonus content that i really just don't share anywhere else thank you so very much for watching watching, hang in there and I'll see you soon.